Houston Texans and current host of Payne and Pendergast is with us today, Seth Payne. We will talk about the Astros. We will talk, is Houston a baseball town and some other fun topics? You know what? Let's t- let's stop talking about it and let's get going right now. Hello and welcome to Locked On Astros, your daily Astros podcast. Here are your hosts, Eric the Man Heisman and Brett H Town Wheelhouse Chancy. We are Locked On Houston Astros, and we're your daily Astros podcast. I'm H Town Wheelhouse. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at H Town Wheelhouse. You can find me at Stros411 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Always positive, always Stros. You can find the show at Locked On Astros on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook, wherever you get your social media. And our special guest today is none other than Seth Payne of Payne and Pendergast. Seth, welcome to the show. Tell everybody where they can find you on Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Seth C. Payne. Also, my YouTube channel, just uh, search Seth Payne. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. And remember to make Houston, um, Locked on Astros your first listen every single day. You can get us on Apple, Google, Spotify, your Odyssey app, or wherever you get your podcast, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. So if you're listening in, we may have an extra segment that goes beyond 30 minutes, a show after the show. Who knows how things will roll with Seth Payne? Because this is a big baller. This is a former NFL guy. <laughs> so he is a heavy hitter. And we, I mean, we just might have to take this a little bit beyond 30 minutes. And if we do that, the only way you can get that content is if you go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. So thank you so much again, Seth, for joining us. You know, you are the consummate football guy because you are on Sports Radio 610, who is the Texans flagship station. But I do know because I listen that you Verse yourself in all things Houston sports, Astros and Rockets. Um, tell me, the Houston Astros, let's just set the table right now. Okay. What do you think of this organization? What do you think about the Houston Astros and what Jim Crane has built here going into 2023? It's it's interesting, isn't it, that we can even have that conversation after after winning this second World Series because because of this shift and because of James Click. And I and I think that. There's if there's one thing that's impressed me about all of this is the adaptability of really good sports organizations that they they understand that you never nothing ever stays the same. It either gets better or it gets worse. And that a lot of times you have to do things that are um, that are kind of unorthodox. And, And I think that's what Jim Crane's in the middle of doing right now. I think the the biggest thing that's impressed me with the team from when everything started to come to fruition from the, the long dark resetting period to 2015 was that like somewhere along the way. And I don't think that analytical people expected this necessarily, but analytics kind of selects for baseball players, basketball players. I, it's starting to be with football players. It kind of selects for guys that are, unselfish professionals like I think because it recognizes especially in basketball it recognizes unselfish play but I think in baseball you ended up with this phenomenon where you had the most analytically minded team in baseball and at the same time they're also in a lot of ways the most lovable team in baseball and and that something that they've retained I think the personality has changed through the years you know that it's now it feels like more of the personalities are on the pitching side of things where early, earlier on with the young guys the position players um but that's what's I I love the blend of those things that it as analytics just seeps more and more into football and there's still have like dinosaurs having arguments about you know <laughs> analytics or non-analytics um it's like it, it's both and it's got to be both. It's got to be the player's side. It's got to be old school, but it's got to be mixed and meshed with everything that you learn to find your blind spots. So, I mean, they're just the epitome of doing that. So it's just it's really cool to just watch how everything has evolved in the way that they've managed to maintain this thing where a lot of people thought the window was going to be closed a long time ago. Well, it makes you wonder, too, you know, if you look in the past, you know, the 04 and 05 season or the 86 season, if the game was like it is today, how much it would have changed? Would it have made it better? Would it have made it worse? 
Um, and you talk about likable guys. And that's one thing we talk about as clubhouse culture. And since we're on that, I kind of want to take a little turn here to recognize one of Houston's greatest athletes that probably ever touched any field in Houston history, J.J. Watt, announced his retirement. And you're going to talk about likable guys. And and I also say this, those of y'all that aren't listening can't see this, but in the comment section it says, wow, I thought Seth was J.J. Watt at first glance. So there you go. <laughs> um, you, you know, don't, don't ask him to sign your J.J. Watt jersey. He is Seth Payne. Yeah. <laughs> but J.J. Watt and what he meant to this city, I, I, I mean, his significance. I mean, this, this announcement, I told my son, I honestly thought there was a day where I would never see this guy retire because he was such – a high motor guy. There was no quit. And I remember the Sports Illustrated cover where where J.J. Watt and Jose Altuve were on that together. I mean, J.J. Watt and Jose Altuve are probably in our lifetime, in everybody's lifetime, two of the greatest athletes that Houston will ever see. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I guess in the thing that really st- – the, the stark – divider there between those two guys is the championships and you know that has nothing to do with JJ or anything he could or couldn't do um that's just the way it works out sometimes we all know you know great great athletes who don't have a championship I think the the biggest thing for me with JJ as a defensive lineman watching him play uh was that there were no lulls in his play. Usually when somebody that doesn't necessarily watch defensive line a lot watches a guy that's a sack artist, a guy that gets 15, 20 sacks in a year, they're kind of shocked by how much inactivity there is. Not that the guy's not playing hard, but that you only make so many plays. You right. know, you only you get 16 sacks in a year, 17 sacks in a year. That's one sack a game and a few hits on the quarterback. J.J., in his stretch where he had those three defensive MVPs, he had he averaged TFLs, tack, um, sacks, uh, quarterback pressures. He had averages that were higher than a lot of guys like Aaron Donald ever achieved in a single season. Like it was wow. just it was freakish how productive he was, um, and it was just it was amazing. It took a lot of like he was freakishly gifted as an athlete, but he also suffered a lot in terms of just how how he was willing to be tired and fatigued in a game. Um, and I think ultimately it probably, it probably took a toll on him physically these last few years. Well, yeah, definitely. It's, it's funny you mentioned that because on the way back from picking my son up from the gym, um, you know, I, I said, Hey, did you hear about JJ Watt? And he said, yeah, he retired. He's, he, he's not very old is he dad. And so I showed him a clip. My son's 14. He goes, when's that from? I'm like, that's from 2011. You were, you were three. Like you yeah. don't really remember <laughs> JJ Watt in his heyday, but I showed him some of the mic'd up. And I said, and I said, look up JJ Watt leg injuries. And he pulled up the knee surgery. He pulled up the the hamstring that the was groin all one. Where is, yeah, yeah, the groin yeah. one. And he goes, he said that was him. I said, yeah. I said, son, he played through that stuff. Like he he played hurt. He played. He came back from a torn pectoral muscle in the in the division series against you know and sacked Josh Allen. You know of the of the you know of the Buffalo Bills and. And I said, you know, he's one of the greatest athletes. I said, him, Jose Altuve, guys like that really make a mark. And I told him they don't just make a mark for what they do on the field. They also make their mark for what they do off the field. And going back, circling back to the Astros, that's what I like about this team is they typically, outside of maybe one or two hires that we can look at in the past and kind of brush those under the rug, the Astros, for the most part, bring in character guys. Um so let's let, let's also talk about this in this segment, um, because in the second segment, we're going to talk about rule changes and what you think about that. And then in the last segment, y'all got to stay put because Seth is going to give us our Houston Astros version of his fantasy football team just using Astros players. We did this with Parker. We want to do this with Seth since he's the football guy. But the debate for years was is is Houston as the Astros are rising? Is Houston a baseball town or is it a football town? Now I know we're in Texas and I know it's the Holy Grail. I know we have sixty thousand people attend state championship football games. You don't have sixty thousand at state baseball games, but because of what the Astros have done, would you say Houston has become a baseball town? This is where I I always struggle with this question because I I want to. I want to speak philosophically about it, but I know where I'm standing, and I know okay. <laughs> like <laughs> you've read the room, right? You've I know read my plat. No, but I plus I know the platform I'm standing on is kind of shaky. <laughs> I do, I do think that 
forever Boston was a baseball town. And then for a couple decades, it became a hardcore football town. And now I think it's really close to being a baseball town again. I do think, though, that the, the one thing that's changed, obviously, is the championships. And, I mean, if you look at any team like, okay, look at football towns like Dallas, championships, um, Pittsburgh, championships with football. Uh, <laughs> Green Bay's never going to get a baseball team. But it's those, the championships are what seals it. So... Uh, and, and I think, you know, baseball, baseball and football in this town, uh, occupy different spaces, obviously, in a lot of ways. I I think that the championship is what is going to seal people in for generations. And the other thing that's happened with football is because, you know, I I talked to people that are in their like mid twenties, late twenties that just didn't have the Oilers or at least their, their households were checked out on the Oilers. And then there was, you know, the period before. So they spent like their formative years, their teenage years, when you really become a sports fan without a football team. And I think that does leave a gap there. So it's uh, without giving any soundbite worthy answer. This is what I'll say in my household. My, my wife's a baseball person. <laughs> like, so she, would she, uh, I, she loses a lot of sleep over baseball. She doesn't lose as much sleep over football. The, I the, hear you. Nobody understands how grueling a world series run is. Uh, like, well, nobody, nobody understands what it's like to go through these things every year, or every other year. Exactly. And, you know, Stan here says H town is a baseball is, is a basketball town. And, you know, he's got something to say about that. I know back in the nineties growing up, watching those two back-to-back NBA championships with Akeem and Drexler and Cassell and Ori and all those guys. But I think, too, right now we're kind of dealing with the recency bias, and that's something I've learned. Um, But if I were a betting man, I would say that the Houston Astros probably stand a really good chance to go back to the World Series, and that gives me a chance to take time to talk about Bet Online. Bet Online is the number one place for all your sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro football to college football season to basketball or whatever it is that you watch. We've got it all at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can go there and find that at Bet Online as well. We're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Will the Houston Astros go back to the World Series? Will the New York Mets meet the Astros in the World Series? What is going to happen in the NFL? Will the Buffalo Bills run to their, to, I believe, their first ever Super Bowl championship? You know, we saw them in the 90s go four times and miss it. But look, Josh Allen is tearing up the league. The Eagles look like, well, their quarterback's not there. What about the Cowboys? So if you want to know about all the latest trends and actions, go to betonline.net. It's where the game starts. All right, Seth, thank you again for joining us. And I I just, I really appreciate your time. Um, Before we get into, you know, let's, let's do this. Uh, Before we get into the rule changes, let's, let's talk about one Martin Maldonado. Okay. Oh yeah. And I'm going to come at you from Martin Maldonado, and I'm going to try to relate it to you in football terms. Okay, um, <laughs> when we when we're looking at Martin Maldonado, okay, you played the defensive line in the NFL. Do you recall players that were maybe on the team that weren't necessarily fan favorites, or people thought, "Why is this person on the team?" But you knew that the you knew that they had to be on the team because them being there, their presence, they were difference makers. You know, because Maldonado kind of gets that from the fan base. They're like, look at his stats, look at his sprint speed, look at all these things. He shouldn't be catching. But everything we hear from the front office, from the players, he's the captain. He he really gets those pitchers focused behind the plate. Did you ever experience that at any level of football you played where maybe a guy was at the end of his career and people were like, he, he needs to hang it up. You're like, no, when he's here, we're here early. When he's here, we're here late. Can you relate that at all to someone that you maybe played alongside or even experienced in, in the NFL? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it, 
nose tackle and defensive tackle, especially, it's a lot like that because you don't get sacks. And a lot of times you don't get even – you could be the best run stuffer on the team and you're not necessarily getting a lot of tackles. So there's a guy, John Yurkovich, who played for the Packers. He played for the Jaguars when I was a rookie. Um, and he just – he had – he might have had the worst body in the history of the NFL, and he'd tell you that. He would admit to that. But he just – he was one of these guys that was super crafty and just so, like, dirty. Not dirty as in dirty play, but just down and dirty, like, willing to do whatever it takes, soak up double teams, all that. And and I think it's notable if you think about nose tackles in football, centers in football, and there's kind of like a, a center line theory of sports where – Sometimes your, your highest IQ guys you want right down the center, your quarterbacks, your free safeties, your middle linebackers, because that's where everything flows from out of there and everything happens immediately. So all those decisions have to be made. Like it's, it's center, at quarterback, at middle linebacker, free safety, right down the center. Those are guys that can kind of direct traffic, and it makes a big difference. So I guess, yeah, safety would be another position that sometimes isn't, isn't an all-pro guy but makes a lot of things work. And I think that's where with Maldonado – you know, this blend between the analytics and what the guys in the clubhouse are saying or what my on the ground boots on the ground information is from the pitchers and the pitching coaches. I think that's where it has to be more art than science in, in making those decisions. Cause I mean, we could look at, you know, you can look at framing, you can look at, you can look at what it, I know, look, batting averages don't matter. 189 is fine. Okay. It's all, <laughs> but we don't have to talk about OPS either. Um, so I, I it was Bill James. What did Bill James say? It was something like, um, just because you, just because you can't measure something doesn't mean it's not there, you know? And, and he wasn't using that as a justification ah. for the it factor or anything necessarily, but he was saying like, look, just because you can't measure something yet, it doesn't mean that it, it's just, it's something that we haven't figured out how to measure yet. So I think there's still room for that. And I, and I think that's, it's, I'd be curious to know what these young pitchers because they just seem they seem so resilient don't they like they seem so bouncy <laughs> like, like they could just uh, and I don't know how much they might not necessarily appreciate or respect Maldonado the same way some of the older guys may have um, and that'll be I, I think that might end up being the difference this year is just kind of how how those guys respond to him yeah exactly I you know in I've never, I've never thought that that his that his value is is any less. But um, David Sampson told it to us. It was it was a great episode. Um, I don't know if you caught that one. He's former president of the Miami of the um, Florida Marlins or Miami Marlins now, I guess. And he said the only teams that are going out seeking offensive catchers are teams that don't have offense in other areas. Yeah. He said offensive catcher isn't something that is, you know, offensive catchers are, are difficult to find. And when, you know, when people got upset that we didn't sign Wilson Contreras, well, it made sense because Wilson wants to be the starter. Why would he want to be a backup to an aging older catcher? He wants to be the guy. And when you talk to Chicago Cubs guys, He's not a very good defensive catcher. And, and so there's just all these different things that I think play into it. And like you said, and I love that quote by by Bill James, but it's it, a, a paraphrasing, okay. <laughs> but something like that. Okay. Yeah, right. But but that sentiment also speaks to me a little bit in a different way that just because you can't measure it doesn't mean it doesn't have any worth. Doesn't yeah. mean that even if it's undiscovered, it doesn't mean that his presence isn't something that's really, really important because I really think if the team thought that he was a hindrance to them, I don't think you would see that $5 million vested option. And look, Yuli Gurriel, tell me what you think about Yuli Gurriel because there's a lot of people, A, I'm wondering what the heck's going on with him. I know he changed agents. He now has Jose Abreu's agent. But everybody, I haven't necessarily written him off. I just feel like they're not going to sign him like, What's going on with him? Do they owe it to him to bring him back? Or does he take a roster spot at his age and be more of a detriment than a help? What do you think? What is what is your perspective on Yuli Gurriel and coming back in 2023? My, I, you know, I think that ideally if he were to come back, it would have to be a two-way street on, 
and giving some, you know, giving a, usually the hometown discount is oversold, but I think in, in this instance, obviously um, it's different. I, the, the biggest thing that I just don't understand and like, I'm, and I understand that I don't understand, like, and I'm saying that the, the situation in Cuba is so unique to any other Latin American country, any other country, really any baseball country in the world. Um, and the fact that the Astros have at any given time, twice as many Cubans in their system as anybody else. And that most of these kids grew up idolizing Yuli Gurriel and the Gurriel family in general. I just, that's another one. Like, okay, I don't know. I, I got, how do you measure that? How do you, how do you, how do you attach a value to that and what it means to an organization? And I do think that I, I think I had sent you in my notes earlier, just that there, he needs to be like, like we need to establish a little Havana somewhere in Houston, like some kind of uh, it's, we've got, it's, it's been amazing how impactful Cuban players have been to, to the Houston Astros and for Yuli to have any kind of a falling out with the organization or to not be kind of thought of as a long-term fixture in the organization, you know, after baseball, I, I would just, you got to tread delicately there. And I don't know how you like, is that worth a roster spot? Is that worth right. keeping a guy around? Um, it would be hard to argue that it would, but it's also, you know, the, these are things that can be massaged perhaps. Exactly. Exactly. And so we've got that on the table. We've got the Maldonado thing. You know, you would think with all the infighting on social media, which I wouldn't take real life and social media as, uh, as one and the same, but you would think that Jim Crane was a complete Scrooge and a miserly person when it came to spending because, dang it, he didn't spend $813 million in the offseason like Steve Cohen. So give me your take on Cohen and the Mets and Jim Crane. His spending, is it adequate? Because in his own words, he said, we're going to take it to the CBT or bust through that. Yeah. What do you think? First, let's go with the Mets. Okay. As far as the Mets, I think I'm like – like everybody else that I've seen or read in baseball where uh, you, the, the owners are trying to be diplomatic, but you can tell they can, you can tell that they feel the Steinbrenner seeping in the old Steinbrenner way seeping in and what the hell are they going to do about it? Um, and that's the biggest, the biggest problem with baseball obviously is that you just have such a vast difference between the haves and have nots. And I think that it, it looked like the owners had, gotten a lot of wins with this last CBA, but it didn't kind of take into account the black swan of somebody showing up and just flat out blowing everything out of the water. I mean, for somebody to somebody, for somebody not to worry about the repeater or the multiplier and the CBT, it's just astounding. <laughs> like, and he's, I, I guess in the NBA, when uh, the Nets owner there, Prokhorov, came in and did the same thing, right. you just got to weather the storm. And I think I don't think anybody's really rich enough to go spending a half billion dollars every year. For well, okay, there's a few guys rich enough to do that, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I just it's a little bit scary as far as Crane goes. I think I've I've tried to as much as I can because us like as fans, we're kind of the children. And ideally, the owner and the GM or the adults where the kids want to go to Disney World, you know, four times a year. And the adults would love to do that. But they got to think about the long term in your college education. Right, right. I think that the same analytically minded people that run Las Vegas are also the same types of analytically people that run the Astros. And Vegas thinks that the Astros are the favorite to win the World Series right now. If you're in a position where you have the best roster and you're in the best position to win... It to me, the knee jerk response is always to be as fiscally conservative as possible until you don't need to, as long as you're already in that position. Um, and Jim Crane is a Jim Crane is worth a mere what two billion dollars. He's not he's not super super rich. He's a damn near pauper. So I I'd say to keep keep his coffers safe until we need to bust them open. I hear you. I hear you. Um, real quick, I want to tell y'all that this episode is brought to you by the NHTSA. We'll get back to Seth's comments here in a minute, and we'll talk to him about rule changes and his fantasy football picks. But right now, I want to bring a special message to y'all because you could be hanging out with some friends and putting back a few drinks. You have a few becomes too many, and as the evening goes on to the end, people start to head out. You think of calling for a ride. Nah, you've got it. 
you live nearby, you can make it home okay, no big deal. Well, what are the odds you'll get pulled over anyway? And if so, what's the worst that can happen? Your insurance goes up, you lose your license, you lose your job, you total your car, you can end someone's life. Everyone knows the risk of, of driving drunk. The results are tragic and often deadly. However, it still doesn't stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on the roads to save lives. So if you, are, if you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again. Play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. And from Locked on Astros, we just want y'all to be safe because we've got New Year's Eve coming up. And we know there's a lot of partying, and Houston is a great place to party. So please do that responsibly. Once again, we got Seth Payne with us, former Houston Texan, former NFL stud defensive lineman, and current radio host with Payne and Pendergast. You can hear him on 610. Tell them when they can hear you on Sports Radio 610 if they haven't had the, had the pleasure of hearing your show. Uh, 6 to 10 a.m., uh, on 6, 10 a.m. every Monday through Friday. And, uh, and contrary to popular belief, we do actually talk a lot of Astros. This was, this was actually a really good World Series for us, the uh, uh, ratings-wise. So it was, uh, I'm very, very grateful to the Astros. Going oh, back me, to the me. time I used to work on CSN and talk about them in 2013. That's awesome. No, and it, I mean, it was, it was good for us, too. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, like, let's keep rolling. Can we have, like, three more titles, please? Because the numbers just keep going up. <laughs> well, that's what I keep telling. I, I don't tell Mets fans this, but I think it when I see them so cocky about winning a World Series, it's nothing will teach you how hard it is to win a World Series like winning two World Series. It's, it's so absurdly difficult. It's amazing how much you don't appreciate it until you go through it and watch it. Oh, yeah, exactly. You know, Seth, my son and I um, got we were at game six of the World Series and, you know, being able to take that in with your son was just just second to none. And um, it's funny, um, I haven't gotten it yet, but I'm going to purchase it because I I just saw it late last night. I think I fell asleep before I hit purchase. That's kind of how things are (laughs) in this online world. But for my grandson, they they have a bib and it says baby's first championship on the bib. And so I, I've got to get him that. And I, I've got to have that as a keepsake. So when I get to take him to a World Series game, hopefully in, you know, years from now, but and we'll be taking him to his first game. But we've got a lot of rule changes that have happened. You know, Rob yeah. Manfred, I mean, I'm sorry, Ma, Rob Manfred, um, the the esteemed commissioner who loves baseball and loves the Astros <laughs> and the Yankees. Um, actually, you know, what's funny is people say he loves the Astros and he hates the Yankees and, and they, and then the other crowd says he hates the Yankees and loves the, like, like he, if he's, if it's your team, he hates them. If he's, if he's someone else's team, he must love them because he's rigging the game, but they got bigger bases. They've got limited pickoff moves. Now we've got a pitch clock. Now I know what the minor league pitchers think about it. Cause we talked to them. Yeah. And they absolutely hate the pitch clock. <laughs> yeah. But they're it's it's like I hear this. We want to shorten the game, but yet they're creating a game by ending the shift, bigger bases, limiting pickoffs. They're creating more offense. What does more offense do? It extends the game. So are the you know, what do you think of the rule changes? What is what are Seth Payne's takes, like hardcore takes, hot seat takes on the rule changes? Do you like them? I I like them, and I think that. I, I think the big issue was less about length of game, even though, yes, they definitely want to shorten the length of the game. I mean, back in the 1950s, the average game was less than two hours, um, or right around two hours. Obviously, TV started to make a big difference. But it, it's um, – and you're not going to get back to two hours. I think it's the amount of action uh, on the base pass, you know, and whether it's either a strikeout, a home run, or a hit into the shift – a lot of those will start to be reduced a little bit theoretically. So I like that. I like, honestly, man, I, if there's one thing I, and I know it's weird, it's weird because baseball right now is in a position where purists didn't want them to get rid of something that's only been around really for about 10 years with the shift. Um, but there's something about a hard hit to where the gap should be in the right infield where I, I'm, I'm still consistently disappointed when all of a sudden it's an easy out, you know, like, right. I, I just like, I want to be able to see guys hit into the gaps a little bit. So there's that part. Yeah. That's just like a, an ode to the old school. But I think as far as some of the gimmicky stuff, 
like the the pickoff limit and the the bigger base paths or bigger bases. I think it'll stop feeling gimmicky and it'll probably just it'd be almost an imperceptible just one one little extra thing that adds some action yeah. to a game. No, yeah, definitely. And I, you know, it's funny we we kind of joked about this a few weeks ago, but I remember when they first brought the big bases over at Constellation Field, Ryan Posner with the Space Cowboys. Um, I was, I was kind of waiting in the wings. Um, it was, it was a day when I interviewed Jake Myers before he had gotten called up and I looked over and I said, Hey Ryan, what is, what is that? He goes, Oh, those are the new bases. It's like, Oh my God, those are huge. He goes, go pick one up. <laughs> I went and picked one up. Like I almost threw out a disc trying to pick up this base. They are and that my, comical, first, huh? <laughs> my first thought was they're going to make these kids steal the bases at, 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 at Minute Maid. The new bases, they're going to have so many lawsuits, kids getting injured, and Eric's like, no, they're going to use the old bases. I'm like, but that's still a funny thought. Like, eight-year-old Andrew injures his thoracic, you know, like, he, you know, he throws out a, a, you know, a disc because he, you know, he chased the base, you know. Um, but, you know, I do – I do want there to be more movement on the base paths. I want to yeah. see Kyle Tucker. I want to see other guys stealing. Probably not Carlos Correa because apparently he's got issues. Um, but I digress. Um, but, you know, I, I like the rule changes if it makes the game better. But this is what I would like them to have done with the shift. I wish they would have limited it. Like yeah. say, okay, Seth, you're the manager of the Astros. Y'all get five shifts each game. Oh. You can shift five different times. Yeah. And then – if you want to shift all three times, Aaron Judge comes up to the plate because he's their strongest pool hitter. Then you can do it all three times. But if you if you shift on the wrong guy, it may bite you in the butt. And so I just think if they would have limited it, um, and you know, kind of like with the sticky stuff, when they totally ban it, that really screwed up a lot of things. Like they should have said, you can use this, this, and this. If you yeah. don't use these three things, you're done. Like like yeah. you're suspended or whatever. And so I think sometimes tinkering with the game too much is is a little bit do you think things like this help the marketability of baseball because i think baseball compared to the nba and the nfl still tend to be inferior when it comes to marketing their players and marketing the sport like the marketing of major league baseball is still mike trout's hitting a ball over the net at top golf like three or four years ago like that's how they market players yeah. but the nfl the nba it, it just seems like I don't know if it's the style of game because it's more exciting. Is there anything Major League Baseball can do to bridge that gap between them and the other mainline sports? I think that there's some of it that's just kind of happened as a groundswell of players coming up and being less absorbed with the old school ways and the unwritten rules. Um, and I'm the like I'd I'd like to think I'm somewhat old school, but as I get older, I like I start getting paranoid that I'm curmudgeonly. So uh, <laughs> like I like I like watching the bad flips. <laughs> like I like I yeah. like watching a lot of the stuff that I probably 10 or 20 years ago would have grumbled about. Um, but I can see how how it just needs to appeal to younger people. And and I know that the numbers are fine and everything, but for for the younger people that are the the future lifeblood, the numbers aren't as great um, as they are in total. So I think that that's at least a start. I think more action is another. And then some of it just really comes down to the act. Like in, in football, football has the national TV deal, and I don't know how there's any way you can really right. replicate that in baseball. But I do wonder if it's one of these things where we can't even necessarily envision or foresee what's going to happen with how we consume sports in the future and that streaming and however in whatever direction that goes might end up being like one of the bigger forces for for kind of pushing the sport forward. Because I, I do think baseball, because I see it with my wife and I see it with a lot of other people and I see it with myself, honestly. I, this is the, first, the first time I ever lived in a city that had a major league team was in Houston. And that was the first time I ever like understood what it's like to be emotionally connected to Craig Biggio or Je Jeff Bagwell at the plate and like right. nervous on behalf of them. Like I don't I don't get that with any other sport except mm. maybe high school volleyball, which is terrifying <laughs> when your niece is out there like in a, <laughs> in a one score game um, right. and wrestling, high school wrestling. There so it's just like so that they've got to figure out some way. And I think social media is is ultimately what ends up doing that. The connection that you feel to baseball players, at least with me, is different than than any other sport.
Yeah, exactly. You know, and I like how you mentioned the TV deals because that's something I don't, I don't, I don't think a think about a lot of times because TV deals is a lot easier, especially with football because it's so what 17 weeks versus nine months out of the year right. in yeah. 162 games. And there's so many games to cover. And so, but you know, this, this moves us into our, our show after the show segment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell our listening audience, thank you so much for hanging out. And Seth, if you don't mind, let's go another 10, 15 minutes or so. Let, let's talk about fantasy football Astros. Oh, yeah. and let's talk about buying or selling. Let, let's do a little fun segment. But thank you all for tuning in. And for our listening audience, Seth Payne, tell them one more time where they can find you and where they can hear you. Uh, at Seth C. Payne on Twitter or any of the social media, Sports Radio 610 in the morning or my YouTube channel. Uh, just search Seth Payne on YouTube. Awesome. Thank you all for joining us. And remember, make us your first listen. And we are your team every single day. Go Strokes. All right. And we are live now. Right now, this is the show after the show on YouTube exclusive. Thank you. If you jumped on after the audio, we have continued the show. Seth Payne has agreed to hang out with us. Um, he, he promised me to Venmo him a couple extra thousand dollars. And so I'll do that <laughs> as soon as my pay, as soon as my account is restored. I'm joking. Um, but Seth, you know, you're a football guy and, and, you know, we are right in the heart. I mean, we are on the cusp of playoffs. You know, you saw this, the, this Texans team like reinvigorated and um, the coach talking about we could win the division going three, one and one and all this crazy talk. Yeah. So with, <laughs> with all this talk of football, I want to put a baseball spin on it. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to draft a fantasy football team but okay. you can only use Houston Astros players. Okay. And we're just going to go with a QB and we can go with one of each. So, so, you know, a running back, a wide receiver, a tight end, a defensive back, a kicker and a kick returner. Who is your quarterback on this team? I kind of think, okay. So for some reason, my first thought was Verlander, which obviously doesn't count anymore. So if my first thought is Verlander, then my second thought has to be Hunter Brown, who would probably have the exact same throwing motion uh, as a quarterback, just like, like Verlander would. But there's something about, if we could spend some time teaching him the game, there's something about Framber's personality that, uh, and now that he's, now that he's got more of a quarterback's like rock solid mentality, uh, I, I feel like I'd have fun with, I feel like I'd have fun with Framber as a quarterback. I almost said Javier, but then I figured his, like Javier's, the invisible ball as a football would be the worst thing in the world for uh, <laughs> because so, the wide receiver wouldn't be able to see where it was going. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It would be like a knuckle ball coming at him. So yeah, I'll go with um, not Hunter Brown. I'll go with uh, I'll go with Framber. Okay. So what about running back? This okay. is an interesting position for a baseball player. Running back. Let me go to. I went to baseball savant and um, Pena is the fastest guy on the team. Oh, there you go. I like that. But I'm, is he too tall? Bit, He's uh, he's six foot. Everybody, by the way, all the fast guys on the team are six foot, except for David Hensley, who's a, oh. who's who's a forward, basically a basketball <laughs> forward. Um, uh, um, I'm gonna say for running back, I'll go with Pena. He's six foot. I, I worry about his durability, so um, <laughs> he'll be a committee, like maybe at a platoon of of three running backs. But I'll go with Pena just because he's so damn fast. But, you know, he's built like a tank, too, and he could always do the, like, he could always do the training camp where, where he does, like, the half shirt showing his abs and his muscles, yeah. you know. I mean, he You're could like kind of Adrian do that. Peterson, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Adrian Peterson or even, you know, um, you know, you know um, the Texans' great running back, Arian Foster, someone like that. Yeah. Um, now, wide receiver. Yeah. This is a tough one because, again, like, uh, Myers is six foot. Chaz McCormick's six foot. Am I allowed to use David Hensley? Oh yeah, um, oh yeah, definitely. I, I think he's our utility guy going in twenty twenty three. I guess I'll go, and I know people are going to say Kyle Tucker, but the thing about Kyle Tucker is Kyle's not actually all that fast. He's just freakishly gets a freakishly good jump on things. His actual speed's like a kind of average speed. That's just how good he is at, at anticipation. Um, boy, but but I bet he'd be a good route runner, and I don't think you he'd mind what? getting hit. I'm going to go with I'll go with uh, Kyle Tucker. Kyle Tucker at wide receiver yeah. or, or would you go Kyle Tucker at tight end and then David Hensley at wide receiver? I've got Jordan saved for tight. Oh, end. oh, there you go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I feel so like Jordan got, would, he'd want to block too. 
There you go. You're okay. So Jordan at tight end. We got Tucker at wide receiver. We've got um, just to recap. We got Pena at running back and Framber Valdez quarterback. Now, who's your defensive back? Who is that guy that is that is chasing down that ball? And if he doesn't get the ball, he's going to put a lick on somebody. It's uh, it's Lance. It's Lance. It's Lance. And it's because I had a conversation with him about this once. Um, about I can't and I can't even remember. I want to say he played either free safety or linebacker in high school. Uh, but he's like he's got that mentality. And like all pitchers that are good fielders, he he wants you to know that he's a better athlete than you think he is. So I feel like he would just have I feel like he'd have that that kind of old school might get suspended a game or two for an illegal hit over the middle type of vibe to him. So uh, Lance <laughs> for defensive back. Lance definitely would do that. Um, we watched um, we watched Alex Bregman when he was at LSU. We had actually moved to Louisiana for two years. Yeah. And when I saw him in college, I remember because, you know, he's he, he's not a very big guy. Um, he's not very I mean, he, he's six foot maybe. I know there's a debate out there in Major League Baseball how tall he actually is. But my dad, who's my same height, five, eight and a half, was a killer gunner on the kickoff team and was a killer like defensive back. And he loved lighting people up. And I was like, I wonder if if someone like Bregman would be one of your like undersized like DBs where like he yeah. he can he could get there, you know, he could disrupt them. Maybe he can't go up and grab the pass with a six foot four guy, but man, he sure can make it hard for him, you know, to make a comfortable catch. You know what you and now I'm realizing I was being way too elitist about the height with the receivers too, because like six foot's fine. These now I'm thinking of like an Andre Johnson, Calvin Johnson, like oh, prototype God. guy. Yeah. And it doesn't it doesn't need to be that. If uh, so my boy, but I think I'm gonna go because for kick return I've, I had that penciled uh, for Chaz McCormick because okay, he's got a yeah. little bit of the kamikaze in him. No, and, I no, um, I like that because yeah. you know he would. Um, he, it, it's almost like he would like he would like dart to the right, but then if he saw a guy he could take on, he would probably take him on, kind of like he did the fence in the World Series. Yeah, he yeah, totally own that. You know, wasn't that beautiful? Like someone, whoever got that picture of his imprint in the dirt after that catch, that's just probably one of the most epic pictures of all time. Yeah, that uh, it, that was that was it. Did you think that was fake when you first saw it? Like I thought for sure it yeah, was just some first, Photoshop. Like, eh, yeah. Okay, whatever Photoshop. Yeah. And then I was like, no, this is legit. Like this <laughs> is the real deal. <laughs> really cool. That is cool. Now kicker, who do you have as kicker? You know, it's funny. Um, someone here in the comments said, "What about Altuve is running back? Hey, maybe a little Barry Sanders action." You know? Yeah, yeah, I know. That's what I I did think. I actually did think of him first. Um, it, but again. I, I guess I'm more willing to be brave uh, with Pena's body than I am willing to be brave with El Tuve's True. body. I just want him. He's getting up there in years. Uh, so I just want to be sure that he's okay. And I'm, there you go. I think El Tuve, because he's compact yet deceptively powerful, that's a kicker to me. I feel like he would, uh, he would just crush it. So back here, I don't know if you can see, I've, I've got a Lions helmet. I actually got a helmet signed by Barry Sanders and Rodney Pete back here. Oh, wow. And so that's a, that's a, that's what we think about that. And then um, right there next to my thumb is an Andre Johnson signed football. Oh, so cool. some of my some of my autographs here. Um, so um, so so kicker, who we who we putting in as um, as a kicker? Who's going to be the kicker? <laughs> oh, that was El Tuve. That oh, was El Tuve. Kicker. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm a fine. kicker. Yeah, El I said Tuve, okay. okay. Yeah, I'm a kicker. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, I I transitioned to the running back. Oh, okay, so. Um, let me, let me ask you this. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to give you some, I'm going to give you some buy or sell, um, questions okay. and you can, you can tell me whether you're going to buy or sell this. Um, my first one is Framber Valdez and Christian Javier both finish in the top 10 in Cy Young voting this next year. Buying oh yeah. Selling. I'm buying that. I'm buying that for sure. Framber gets that extra bump up in credibility this year because people take him. He'll be in the conversation earlier. And Javier, presumably, um, presumably if he's a starter at the beginning instead of like taking their time to stretch him out, he was. I'll, I'll tell you what, honestly, this is one of the reasons I like listening to Locked On. I like Locked On Astros, and I listen to you guys a lot. Locked On in general, like I'll listen to the opposing Locked On. Um, like if they're, you're playing Philadelphia or right. somewhere else, um, football every week, I do that. Cause you get like, you get the information on guys like Christian Javier. Cause Javier, I got so tired of, I got so tired of realizing that people in other fan bases didn't have a clue about Javier. And then you realize, oh, it's because 
he didn't have enough innings to qualify for the leaderboards and all this stuff. Exactly. So, so he just flew under the radar, including with, you know, a lot of media types because he just didn't show up as having this incredible performance that he was. So yeah, i I'm very, very confident that he's going to handle the increased innings with a plum and, uh, and be right up there. Awesome. So are you buying or selling this? Jordan Alvarez hits 50 home runs in 2023. 50 home runs. <sighs> Boy, what's his high? 37 in a season? Is a, I think so. If he was healthy this year. Hmm. <laughs> let's, let's, say, let's, say, let's say if he's healthy. If he's, if healthy, he's healthy all season. <clears throat> okay. If he's healthy all season, I'd say yes, because he's – hopefully going to be in another home run race with Aaron judge. It's okay. Cause we know it won't matter in the postseason. So, uh, yeah. Or, I think that... or if he's, or it, or if he's fed the Goldilocks balls, maybe he hits 70. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hey, what, Hey, by the way, David Sampson, um, who I, I love because he's given a lot of shed a lot of light on, um, the way things were in 2017. I was, did I hear him correctly though? Also say that he thought that the Goldilocks ball study wasn't quite, um, he was skeptical of the study, wasn't he? Yeah, you know, after I looked into it myself, too, because I kind of dove in deep with that thing, and I kind of yeah. put myself out there on Twitter, kind of laid myself bare a little bit. <laughs> but afterwards, I was like, mm, I don't know if this is really legit, but I didn't really. And now I, I'm actually kind of being vulnerable here. I'm I'm sitting in my, you know, you're my you're my counselor with thousands of people listening. Yeah. But, um, yeah, like afterwards, because the guy that put it out there, he had parody in parentheses by his name. And I was like, going, oh, did we just get taken? Because like everybody ran with it, right? Did we just everybody. call a pizza box a computer monitor? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Our next one is an interesting one because it has a Rockets Texans theme. Buying or selling, the Rockets make it to the playoffs before the Texans. Oh, boy. I would say, if I had to gamble, I would say that the Texans make it to the playoffs sooner, but that the Rockets go deep into the playoffs sooner. Okay. Um, I think that the, the Rockets could make it back to a conference championship. Just uh, there's a life cycle thing going there. Where the football, I think you can football. I think they could get they could get back to the playoffs. But does that mean you know, like wild card or or what have you? Um, right. Where the Rockets, uh, the Rockets could be positioned. Depending on what James Harden de decides to do, of course, it could turn around a lot quicker. All right. Here's another Texans question. And I don't know if you're allowed to answer it per, per company policy, but I'm oh, going to okay. ask you anyways. Buying or selling? Lovey Smith saying the Texans are actually gunning for a division title. I'm, <laughs> I'm selling that on the basis of simple logic um, and the way that. The way the rules work, I like it as I like it as maybe whatever motivational tactic he's using to to motivate those guys. There is something though. There is something about it that's a little bit of a. It's a little embarrassing on behalf of the AFC South in general that, that you could <laughs> that you could have that good of a you could be this bad of a team but have a, a, a the best record against divisional opponents. Oh. Um, yeah, I would rather just try to just not a, not call attention to that at all. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So okay. I'm selling I'm selling that hard. I'm selling okay. it hard, but approve like approving it as a motivational tactic. I guess. Right. It, it, exactly. Um. And you know, one day I'll. I'll tell you a I'll tell you a great story from uh, coaching um, seventh grade girls basketball. I've I found ways to motivate young athletes, and let me tell you, when it works, those motivational speeches, you feel like you're on top of the world. But oh yeah, I, I'll tell you some <laughs> other time. So buying or selling, the Astros win two more World Series in the next four seasons. Okay, two more World Series in the next four seasons. I mean, now that's now that's a tall order. I, I'll just yeah. say that's that's me asking a lot, but I don't think it's you know too off of a question to ask: buying or selling. The Astros are the only team in baseball whose projected starting five are all homegrown, um, which means that they've got a few more years of arbitration on average with these guys. The Kyle Tucker being re-signed, Jordan. Uh, I'm saying if if Kyle Tucker was re-signed, um, and as long as Jordan stays healthy and he's here, um, 
I'm, I'll buy that. I'll buy it. And it's, uh, and I, I realize how, I realize that that's mathematically improbable and it doesn't make sense. But I'm so, I'm so, I get so uh, PO'd about the concept of windows um, <laughs> that it, it makes me obstinately want to believe that they can just continue this. I do right. think that their player development system um, from single A on up through the majors is still so much further ahead of teams like the Mets that, you know, they, they want to buy and they want the short fix, but what are you doing? What are those teams doing for when they have low draft picks or no draft picks um, to develop the guys that all of a sudden, you know, like Jeremy, Jeremy Pena wasn't a top 100 prospect last year. You know, like yeah. the Astros pipeline is just pathetic. It's bereft. And, oh, but these guys, once a year, twice a year, somebody steps up. The whole damn pitching staff right now, you right. Know, other than Lance, uh, were guys that nobody really, uh, d- you know, gave a lot of thought to too long, not too long ago. No, yeah, definitely. And the last one, and we'll kind of wrap it up after this a little bit. Buying or selling, Billy Wagner eventually gets into the Hall of Fame, if not <sighs> this year. Okay, so he got like fifty percent this year, right? Yeah, he's, and... well, he's so of the ballots that I've seen, he was at like sixty-seven or sixty-eight percent, but that was only like fifteen ballots that had been seen. Not oh, even. Oh, okay. So um, let's see. I think that, and he's got have two or two years left this year, next year. I or believe is it... so. Yeah, okay. I, I believe he only has like. I mean, he's he he's got a limited window. I think he I think he gets in because there's been such a groundswell of like people showing adamantly that like all right listen okay I know you guys are hung up on saves and other BS stats that don't matter anymore like this guy is the best strikeout rate of all time like he's just if right. you look if you you compare him to Rivera and these other guys he was just as dominant if not more and um and I think that that push that push as he gets closer to the cutoff date is going to end up being enough of a groundswell that he makes it. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I agree with you. Um, I did see one, I did see one um, reporters um, tweet on it and I won't mention his name cause he's blocked me. So I don't think he deserves a oh, mention, sure. <laughs> um, but he, uh, he basically said that Billy Wagner, because he had such a poor postseason record, he couldn't consider him in the in the Hall of Fame. And I'm like, but what about like Nolan Ryan, guys like that that never, never, I mean, he won a World Series when he was a rookie with yeah. the amazing Mets. But after that, he he wasn't a part of a World Series winning team. And so championships and that debate kind of comes in. But, you know, said this has been a great conversation. Like, like if you guys think that on Sports Radio 610, the false narrative that they are just all about Texans and they can't talk about anything else, but Houston Astros. I, I beg to differ because Seth Payne brought it. Like he brought the hardcore. This was great, man. You, you did a phenomenal job covering all things. Um, your, your prowess from your background as a professional football player. Now as an on-air radio talent, listening to you game days, um, with the Texans. I love the Texans radio network. They do a phenomenal job. You do a great job. Um, you know, any, any parting words for the locked on Astros listeners? Uh, no, just keep doing what you're doing. Baseball is I like, I was a casual fan. I guess I'd call myself a casual when I was, you know, a player back in Houston. like when I first got into baseball, the cool thing about when I started getting, when I got into radio, like as a football dude, was that I got to follow the Astros from like the very bottom, but with with Luno and Crane and on into AJ Hinch and kind of I, I got to learn baseball like in depth the way like a lot of Astros fans know baseball, and it's just kind of a unique environment to have like seen to seeing the Astros just put it out there like just to put their cojones on the table and do stuff that uh, everybody else thought was crazy or cockamamie and to follow through with it. And I think with Jim Crane, you got to recognize <clears throat> the fortitude that it took to listen to people call him a moron. And, you know, and Luno, I give yeah. Luno a lot of credit for this too. The hardest thing about whether you want to call it a hard reset or a tank or anything and why teams continually fail at it is that they lack the intestinal fortitude to follow through with it. Um, and those two guys, Luno and Crane, just 
listened to it all and took it all in and just stayed the course. And, and the really amazing thing is that they pushed through that period where, Oh, you've just got those high draft picks that are playing well. Now those guys are, those guys are gone, you know, right. um, or a lot of them are gone. And, and uh, it's, it's just, I would say, have faith in crane. I think that um, he's not, he's not all of a sudden like shifting the whole paradigm. They've got dozens and dozens of the analytics staffers over there still. And um, I think that I think the future is, is just as bright as it's ever been. It, it kind of reminds me, um, I was a big Miami hurricane fan growing up. I'm originally from Florida. And so I, I was a big hurricanes guy growing up. And I remember when Larry Coker won the national championship um, when he was there at Miami, um, they asked him like, and, and this was after he left Miami, they were like, how, how tough was it to coach there? He said, well, go, he, he said, when you go 12 and 0 on the season and you win a national championship and at the celebration with the booster club, someone comes up to you and says, well, coach, I hope we do better next year. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> That's how tough it is. And so the thing is what I love about this team and I'll close with this, the Astros going into next year, are again the favorites. But World Series hangover, I don't see it. This team has so much experience, even with only three guys remaining from the 2017 team. The Astros are poised to win another championship. And this has been a championship episode, an off-season special with Seth Payne. And I'm telling you, our guests are already saying, you need to bring him back on. They loved having you on. You got people that listen to your show that say, you know what? I didn't know what he looked like until now. Now I know what he looks like. So just get ready to be hit up in Target or Kroger and get your autograph because they saw you on Locked on Astros. I'm H-Town Wheelhouse for myself, Eric Van Heisman, who's not here right now hanging out with his family, and for Seth Payne and everybody in Locked on Astros Nation. Thank you for tuning in. And remember, we are your team every single day. Go Strohs.